This is how it all ended. A quiet morning, with a splicing truck pulling out of our back parking lot. Within a few hours, I'd have an order placed for fiber optic internet. It took a year and nine months to get my building wired for fiber optics so that we could have an alternative to the local cable provider. Getting everything built out was definitely a process, but at the end of the day, it was done at no cost to us, and it was definitely worth it. I spent a good amount of time on forums during this project, and plenty of others were asking the same question that I asked back in July of 2019. How do I get fiber in my building, and what is the process like? I wrote a few detailed Reddit posts, but I figured it might be interesting to make a video on what it actually took. So let's take a look at what it takes to get your building wired. The first question to ask is whether there's a fiber to the home provider in your area. If you know what to look for, there may be telltale signs around your neighborhood, but identifying the infrastructure is a bit beyond this video. In my case, Verizon had wired our neighborhood for fiber optics several years before, but our building was not wired, which is pretty typical. If you're living in an apartment, condo, co-op, or other similar arrangement, you're living in what's called an MDU in telecom speak. Uh, MDUs cost more to wire, so they're typically skipped during an initial build-out uh, if the provider is willing to upgrade them at all. But if there's fiber in the neighborhood, reach out to whoever the provider is and ask. That's the only way you'll know. Every company has a different process for this, but with Verizon, you need to ask for what's called a fast ticket. I happen to have a Verizon contact, so I just sent them an email, and within a few days, the answer came back. Verizon was willing to explore the process. I live in a mid-sized condo building in Washington, D.C., and six months before, I had volunteered to join the board when there was a vacancy. If you're renting or in a huge complex with many units, you're going to need to convince the powers that be of the value of a project like this. Part of the reason why MDUs don't get wired is that landlords and boards just don't want to take on the work. And having been through the process, I can understand why, although there are a lot of benefits to having your property wired. But if you're in a smaller building like myself, I'd encourage you to volunteer. Many boards are under-resourced and underappreciated, and offering to help or joining the board itself is what it takes to get something like this done. It's also valuable to have someone who's motivated to push the project along. Your property management company isn't going to care if you get fiber in six months or six years, so the project will get done faster if someone with a personal stake in the outcome is involved. I simply asked fellow board members whether there was any interest in pursuing this project, and they said as long as I was volunteering to manage the process, go right ahead. But there were two big caveats. Number one, they didn't want any exposed wiring on the outside of the building. And number two, we didn't have any money in the budget for this. In our case, neither was an issue. Verizon said they'd do an assessment of our building to determine the possible installation paths, and if a suitable path was found, they'd fund the project. This won't always be the case. Verizon is particularly motivated to retire its old copper infrastructure in our area, and to do that they need to move customers to an alternative, which is fiber optics in this case. In some cases, an ISP may ask the building to share in the costs, or require an agreement from a certain number of residents for service before they're willing to build. Verizon did send us an agreement, 
but all we needed to do was agree to let them leave their equipment on site for 10 years if we agreed to have service installed after we reviewed their proposal. I showed the contract documents to our board and we agreed to move ahead. There's two parts to an installation, getting a pathway built to all units and then actually pulling the fiber to the units. Verizon and most ISPs use contractors for the first part, building the pathway. Once you have a signed agreement, the contractors will come out on site to do an inspection. They typically want to see one unit of every configuration, so you'll have to get some of your neighbors on board and arrange access to their units. If you have a copy of the building blueprints, having them on hand or emailing them ahead of time is also very helpful. For us, the contractors were only on site about half an hour, and they quickly came up with a plan. This will be different for every building, so don't necessarily take our experience as representative. After the on-site inspection, the contractors will draw up formal plans for the work, showing exactly what they plan to do. In our case, we have two buildings with three units per floor over four floors. They would run through the utility closets of one stack of units and then extend the conduit over that unit to the other two stacks and drop down back to the bottom floor. This would keep all wiring hidden and contained within the utility closets, but the contractor issued a warning. If one owner does not permit access, the entire project would stop in its tracks. With the plans in hand, it was back to the board. Everyone thought it would be best to get unit owner feedback, so we distributed the full set of plans along with a two-page letter I wrote explaining the benefits. I emphasized that no unit would be obligated to switch to Fios, and there would be no cost to the building. The coax cable in our walls was older, and many owners previously had trouble with cable internet, so I mentioned this was a solution to that problem without the building needing to pay for major wiring upgrades. We barely received any feedback on the proposal, but what we did hear was positive. We also reviewed the condo bylaws and consulted with our attorney. We had provisions to require access to install utility services, but the attorney pointed out that if someone refused access, they could make our life very difficult, regardless of what the bylaws said. He advised an over-the-top outreach campaign, emails, flyers, letters, everything you could possibly think of, ahead of access being required. I do want to note, though, that some of these challenges were a result of the specifics of our plan. I've seen photos of build-outs where conduit is pulled through ducts installed in hallways, so access to each unit isn't required. I also have friends who live in buildings where Verizon just strung the fiber along the exterior of the building, so that's another approach that doesn't require access to each unit. But every building is different. Given our constraints, this approach made sense, and with no unit owner objections, we gave the go-ahead to Verizon. Patience was crucial throughout this process. There's a lot of waiting. I'll admit I'm someone who's unusually passionate about my internet connection, but once the process was underway, you just have to sit and wait for someone to call. We started everything with Verizon in July of 2019. We had the inspection in September and had the plans approved by November. In early March 2020, contractors came out to install the pull ropes that would be used to pull the fiber optic cable from the street and between our two buildings. The contractors arrived when I was at work, but from everything I heard, it all went well. Less than two weeks later, the country shut down. Understandably, everything stopped. Yet the situation highlighted the benefits of this project. With so many residents working from home and upstream bandwidth increasingly important, having quality internet was even more important than ever before. I checked in with Verizon's contracts a few times throughout 2020, but advised all the owners to not expect any progress until the country had fully reopened. In early December, I was surprised to get an email from the contractors. They had begun working on residential installs again. Would we be interested in moving forward? They told me that they could install the install in less than two weeks if we were ready. But now the landscape was very different, regardless of what our bylaws said. We just couldn't ask anyone to let contractors into their home if they were not comfortable. The pandemic was very much in full swing. So I wrote up an email to all the owners, and I sent it out. Out of 26 units, we had four responses. Three were supportive, and one was not comfortable. But the unit that was not comfortable was on the bottom of a fiber drop. They just happened to be in one of the only units that would not have an impact on the project if they didn't want to allow access. We sent another reminder email, and we put notices on doors. 
We received another response or two, all positive. So I scheduled the install date to fall just after the new year. In mid-December, I met the contractors at the building to conduct a pre-construction walkthrough. Everything looked good, and I told them I'd see them in a few weeks. But out of 26 units, we'd only heard from five, maybe six. It was time to get serious. I wrote up a notice with stronger wording and taped it to everyone's doors. It stated access required, cited the bylaws, and provided the dates that the contractors would be on site. That did the trick. Finally, I had everyone's attention, and my phone started to ring. One unit wouldn't be available on the dates, so we shifted them slightly. Another unit outright refused access, but they were at the bottom of a different fiber drop, so I told them it wasn't a problem, but I clarified exactly what we were doing. As soon as I did, they replied that they misunderstood, and they absolutely wanted files installed. I left the area mid-December to spend Christmas with my family out of state, and drove back right before the install was scheduled to begin. The morning of the install, I was pretty nervous. Everything hinged on getting access to all units. We were going to start with the building I lived in and proceed to the next building a few days later. Each building would take two to three days. Work began with drilling down through the utility closets in the first stack of buildings. My unit was at the top of the first stack, which was intentional. If we discovered any unexpected surprises, I wanted the crews to figure them out in my unit before they moved on to others. As work got underway, I crossed my fingers that the contractors wouldn't call me and tell me there was a problem. While one crew was drilling down, another one was working on our lower level, pulling the conduit from the telecom room. The conduit is known as microduct, and once installed, Verizon would come out and pull fiber optic cable through it. While drywall needed to be cut in our common areas to run the microduct, the contractors assured us that they would restore it to its original condition once everything was completed. I provided information on our paint colors in advance to make sure that everything would be restored properly. By midday, the contractors were beginning to pull the microduct up through the units, and by the end of the day, they had the microduct pulled up to my unit at the top of the first stack and they had bundled everything together downstairs and begun restoring the drywall in the hallway. On the second day, the plan was to pull the microduct into an attic space above my unit, then over to the other two stacks of units, and then pull it down through their utility closets. That's where the project hit its first snag. The contractors discovered there was not enough space above the top floor to get their crews into the attic area. They need to run the microduct through the ceilings of the units on the top floor. I gave them permission to cut as much drywall as they needed in my unit, but immediately began to worry. I had assured everyone that no drywall would need to be cut inside the units, and now there was a major change in our plans. The contractor spoke with the other two residents on the top floor, and they agreed to allow the installation to proceed, and I dashed off an email to the residents in the other building, and I hoped no one would object. The remainder of the day went well. Everyone's drywall was patched and painted, and I told the contractors I'd see them again the next morning to start the second building. And then it happened. At 6.30 at night, the day before the second install, my phone rang. It was an owner in the second building. In no uncertain terms, he told me that the contractors would not be permitted in his unit tomorrow. He didn't like the tone of my notice, he couldn't find the area of the bylaws I was citing, and he had no interest in whatever service we were installing. I quickly scanned the prints from Verizon. He was the first unit they needed to get through. The entire building would be blocked. I offered to come by to meet him, and he agreed to talk with me. But he wouldn't let me come that night. He told me I should come the next morning. I got very little sleep that night. I ran out to a store and bought some baked goods at the suggestion of a friend printed out copies of all of our governing documents in the Verizon plans, and tossed and turned for most of the night. In the morning, the contractors arrived and I explained the problem. They could start work on the lower level, but could not begin to drill through units. I encouraged them to start to think about alternative pathways if I was not successful. I knocked on my neighbor's door and was greeted by a very nice man. He invited me in, and we proceeded to chat for 40 minutes about the state of the building, his time living there, and what the project involved. 
At the end, he thanked me for coming by and told me it was okay for them to run the conduit through his utility closet, but he didn't have an interest in having a conduit terminated in his unit. I thanked him for his time and let the contractors know we were good to go. I had told my neighbor that they might be by in a few hours. They were starting from the top and drilling down. But when I talked to the contractors, they immediately knocked on his door and subsequently began drilling. They didn't want to give any opportunity for him to change his mind. None of the top floor neighbors had concerns about needing to cut drywall, and over the next two days the installation proceeded on schedule. All of the microduct was labeled and bundled together in the telecom rooms, and I was told that Verizon would be in touch for the next steps. At this point, the job of the contractors was done. But after waiting a few weeks and hearing nothing, I checked in with them to see if they could provide me any updates, and they directed me to a Verizon Escalations email. I got a response back from Verizon right away, saying that our installation would be complete by mid-April. But at this point, it was still January, and that seemed like a pretty far ways away. After another month went by, we were in late February, and I decided to check in again. This time, good news. They had moved the schedule up and told us we would be complete by the end of March. It's worth noting here that Verizon is typically dealing with a property management company, so the process is really set up around that. Unless unit access was required, I never received any advance notice, and I simply looked out my window in the morning and hoped to see a Verizon truck. On March 11th, my phone rang. It was the foreman of the contracting crew that had been out in January. He told me there was a Verizon supervisor on site who needed to get in touch with me, and he didn't have my number. I quickly ran down, met him, and showed him the work that had been done in January. He declared everything looked good and told me to expect the line crew to pull the fiber optic line from the street in the next week or two. On the morning of March 16th, I heard a truck slow down outside my window and looked out and saw a Verizon truck with a big spool of fiber on the back. I was thrilled. The project was finally moving forward. I ran out, met them, got them access to the telecom room, and went back inside to start my workday. Then the phone rang. I was needed back outside. The crew discovered that while the contractors who had been out a year before ran a pull rope between our buildings and from the pole into the manhole, they did not run one from the manhole to the building. It was the only part of the install I had not been present for. The line crew told me there was nothing they could do for me, packed up, and left. It felt like a tremendous setback. I'd been staying close to home since January to ensure that I'd be on site when Verizon showed up. Now I had no idea when the project would be finished, and I started to wonder if I just needed to find somewhere safe to travel and go and take a break. The next morning, I looked out my window and was surprised to see a Verizon truck. It was the supervisor who had been out a week before. He told me he was trying to figure out why the crew had not been able to pull the fiber the day before. He spent some time researching and found a report from the contractors who had installed the pull rope. They claimed that the conduit was blocked and they were not able to run a pull rope through. It seemed that it was blocked 14 feet from the building. The supervisor told me he'd have to take the issue back to the engineering group to see what they wanted to do. In some cases, he suggested it might be our building's responsibility to clear the conduit, but he'd report back once he knew more. Now, the average disinterested person would have probably just left things there and been patient. But for better or worse, I am not that person. It seemed like we were so close to having this project finish, and yet it felt so far away. So I went out and I immediately purchased an inspection camera on Amazon. The camera only had a 25-foot cord, and the length of the conduit was anywhere between 100 and 150 feet, depending on the exact path it took. But if the blockage was 14 feet from the building, maybe I could figure out what was going on. When the camera arrived, I snaked it down the conduit on the building side. The conduit looked pretty clear. You can see our existing telephone cable in it. And then I hit something at about the 18-foot mark. I couldn't tell what it was exactly, but I couldn't get the camera around it. I pulled the camera back to get a better look. It still wasn't completely clear as to what I was seeing, but I took a few still shots and brought the camera inside to see if I could make better sense of what I had run into. Once I was looking at the images on my computer, I suddenly realized what I was looking at. The first conduit fed into a slightly more narrow conduit, and sitting in that conduit was our existing phone cable and something big and shiny. 
It was an old phone cable that had been cut off and left in the conduit, but there was still plenty of space. Is that what the contractors had gotten snagged on, I wondered? Was it possible that a guy who had never worked a day in his life in the telecom sector had figured out a problem that a group of trained telecom contractors couldn't solve? I happened to have a set of fiberglass rods for wire fishing, which I had used when I wired my unit with Ethernet cables the year before. I pulled them out to see if I might be able to get them past the cable and see if there was a larger obstruction further down the conduit, but I only had 25 feet of it. I ran them down the conduit and ran into the snag at 18 feet. So I pulled them a little bit back, tried again, success. I was able to run all 25 feet of rods into the conduit. The next day, a Verizon tech showed up and he installed the fiber distribution hubs in each building. These are the boxes that would allow the technicians to connect the fiber lines that ran to each unit to the service that came in from the street. But we still didn't have the fiber pulled from the pole yet. Another few days went by with no news. For better or worse, I couldn't sit on my hands, waiting for Verizon Engineering to decide on their next move. I needed to answer this question myself. Was the conduit truly blocked? So I ordered another five sets of fiberglass rods online. It took another week for them to arrive. When they did, I began to assemble them and feed them into the conduit, four feet at the time. Every time I'd push another segment in, I'd hope I wouldn't hit a blockage. In the end, I was able to run the rods all the way out to the manhole that fed the pole. Then I took some mule tape, which is the term for the wire pulling rope used by telecom contractors that had been left over from the installation in January, and I pulled it back to the building and tied it off like I had seen the contractors do. I sent another email with photos to the Verizon supervisor. I can't imagine what this guy thought about me. The supervisor replied and said that he sent everything over to the engineering team and was awaiting their next move. A week later, a team of contractors arrived to look at the manhole. I met them and showed them the pull rope I'd run, and I think they were pretty pleased that most of the work had already been done for them, but they decided to reinforce the mule tape by using a thicker rope and running two sets of it, which they said would ensure the rope wouldn't break when they were pulling a larger cable. They also opened up the manhole, pumped out some water, and then headed on their way. A few days later, I got a call. This time it was the Inside Path team. Their job was to pull fiber through the micro ducts that ran into each unit. I hadn't realized that this was going to be done beforehand. I assumed it would just be done at the time that service was ordered. But they set up a time the following week to come out and pull the fiber in to the units in both buildings. This prompted another round of notices out to unit owners and emails to everyone in the building. But this time there was a lot less pressure. Since the conduit had already been run, if a unit wasn't available to get their fiber pulled, it wasn't the end of the world. It would just take longer for that individual unit if they needed the fiber run after they placed an order. The inside path team started early. They were here on site at 7 a.m. and I had prepared a schedule for them based on the availability of various unit owners in the building. Some were leaving for work at a particular time, or others were out early and wanted the installation done later in the day, so I put together a sheet that they could reference to hopefully get as many done as possible, and also minimize the inconvenience for those who lived in the building. I took the morning off from work to oversee the progress, and spent the time chatting with these guys, answering questions about how the conduit was run, and just taking in the process. Within each microduct, there was a pull string. They would attach the string to a fiber optic cable and then pull it through the microduct and then seat it in the fiber wall jack that had been installed in each unit in January.
Finally, I could rest easy. Everything was in place. We had the fiber from the street, the fiber to the units, and all the other equipment that was required to get us up and running. All we needed was for a splicing crew to come out and attach everything together. Fiber splicing is actually pretty cool. I've been watching some videos on YouTube while I waited for this project to wrap up. Fusion splicing uses a machine that very precisely aligns the fibers and then uses an electric arc to melt them together. We were almost at the finish line, but I was also now fully vaccinated and excited to leave town to see some family and friends who I hadn't seen in a while. But I was not going to leave until the splicing was all complete and this project was wrapped up. A week went by, then a second week. No news. I reached out to the Verizon supervisor I'd been dealing with, but he told me he had gotten a promotion and transferred out of the area. He did give me the name of someone else, though. I sent my new contact an email, and within an hour, he was at the building. He checked everything out and confirmed that we had everything that we needed done, and we were just waiting for the splicing to occur. He told me that while he did not oversee the splicing teams, he'd send them a note reminding them that our building was ready to be spliced. Then he headed out, and I went back to my workday.